Thank you, Barak, for that introduction. A uh, little bit more uh, introduction to myself. I'm a uh, uh, Apache PMC Spark member, uh, Spark committer since the beginning of Spark. And uh, I've worked on Spark streaming, DStreams before. Um, that was my pet project back in grad school in AmpLab. Um, now it's gone pretty big. Uh, that's incredibly gratifying for me. Now I work on structured streaming. And um, hopefully, uh, you find the stuff that I'm going to talk about interesting. So the way this uh, deep dive session is constructed is that um, I'm going to assume a little bit of the, uh, that you, you're familiar with the basics of structured streaming and the basics of Spark SQL, base, uh, uh, basics of Spark data frames, and I'm going to take it off from there. Actually, on, uh, that reminds me, actually, how many people here, can I see, a, uh, can I see hands who are familiar with Spark data frames? Ah, everyone. How many people here are familiar with Spark structure streaming? Slightly less. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, in a way, I kind of anticipated that, so I have a kind of brief introduction of what structure streaming is and what it looks like. So, let's start off. So, if you're not familiar with what structure streaming is, it is basically a stream processing uh, platform built on the Spark SQL engine and the Spark SQL APIs. It's obviously fast, scalable, fault tolerant. It, it essentially provides rich, unified, high-level APIs in the form of data frames and data sets. So that allows you to deal with uh, complex data and complex variation of workloads. And it, similar to all of Spark, it, uh, it has a rich ecosystem of data sources uh, from which it can uh, read and write from. So the basic philosophy with which we built structured streaming is that you as an end user should not have to reason about streaming. You as an end user should essentially write simple batch-like queries and it's Spark's job to continue, figure out how to actually run it on a continuous stream of data and continuously update the answer as new data flows in. And the basic um, realization that we had and that led to what uh, structured streaming looks like is that you can always treat a stream of data as an unbounded table. So every record on a data stream is like an unbounded input table. Every, every record is uh, like a row being add, added, appended to that unbounded input table. And so now you can represent both batch, that is static bounded data, as well as streams, unbounded data, as tables. And that allows you to express your computations with respect to tables, and, and let Spark figure out how to actually run it either on static data or on streaming data. So on that note, there are a couple of empty seats out here, one out here, three out here. If people are not nervous about sitting in the French bench, they, they could come here. Some people are perfectly fine being backbenchers. That's also fine. Oh. Anyways, so let's... To, to, to have a very brief introduction of what it looks like, let's look at a simple streaming query. Well, simple, but often something this simple actually leads to very complex uh, pipelines, complex code in other streaming systems. Uh, but I'll show you how exactly this becomes so simple inside using structured streaming. So let's say you have, a, uh, you have to set up an ETL pipeline where you're getting JSON data from um, Kafka. You want to parse it. You want to... Uh, 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 convert it into a more structured form and uh, write it out into a parquet table. And of course, you want to get end-to-end -end fault tolerance guarantees because you don't want any failures to uh, drop data or create duplicate data. So, and uh, here we go. So first, first step is to actually create a data frame from Kafka. And so you specify spark.readstream, you specify the, the, your reading from Kafka, how to read the bootstrap servers, which topic to subscribe, et cetera. And there are multiple built-in uh, support, uh, supported sources, uh, like files. Also, Kinesis is part of our Databricks runtime. Uh, and you can have multiple input streams in the same query. You can join them together, et cetera. I'll talk about those later. Uh, but ultimately, what you get is essentially a Spark data frame. And Spark data frame is a single unified API for uh, manipulating batch and streaming data in Spark. Now, in this case, this, this particular Kafka data frame looks like this. It has basically a bunch of columns giving all the details of every record in Kafka, the key, the value, their binary values, the topic and the partition from which it came from, the, the 
the timestamp in which it entered Kafka, etc. Now, and now that it looks like a table, you can do a standard data frame and table-like operations inside Spark to actually parse it. For example, first of all, I, the, the data is binary. I need to cast it to a string, then uh, parse that string into JSON with this built-in function called from JSON. Uh, all of these standard manipulations. And, 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 and that's the cool thing about Spark that it comes with hundreds of built-in uh, SQL functionalities that are designed to be simple to use and st standard semantics and incredibly fast to execute because we do all the underlying uh, fancy code generation, et cetera, to make them really fast. Finally, after, uh, now that you have the parse data, you want to write it out to some parquet table. So that's where you specify the format parquet, the, the path to which you're writing to, and uh, there are, there are built-in support for files, Kafka, and you can add your own arbitrary logic to write it out to arbitrary data sources by uh, this thing called for each, where you, you can do whatever operation you want on every record. And then finally, you want to specify how to exactly run this query, which is I want to trigger it every one minute. I want to. Uh, I wanted to checkpoint all the information, uh, all the metadata and data, whatever needs to checkpoint to restart from failures into a given location. Uh, this should be something like HDFS or S3 or Azure Blob Store, of um, something fault tolerant, and then finally I call start. And when I call start, what happens is that internally Spark essentially translates this code into a logical plan, which is an abstract representation of what the query does. Then it converts it to a much more optimized plan uh, where it figures out exactly what, what sort of optimizations can be pulled in, uh, how to generate the code in the most optimal form given you, uh, all the built-in functions that you have used. And then from that template of an optimized plan, it generates a continuous series of incremental execution plans. So as there is new data comes in, uh, each it breaks it into micro batches and processes it uh, and cannot and writes it out to the parquet table. So it is essentially Spark's job to figure out that the, this p very batch-like query that you have written, that you could have run it on a batch data as well. But since you're asking Spark to run it on a Kafka stream, it'll, Spark will automatically figure out how to run it incrementally on uh, the streaming data. And with checkpointing, uh, you get complete fault tolerance guarantees. Because, and because what it does is that at the beginning of every, every micro batch, it will write out the uh, offsets from Kafka it is going to process into a write ahead log so that if case of any failure, it can exactly reprocess uh, the same range of data in exactly the same deterministic manner. So you get end to end exactly one's guarantees. And <clears throat> so, the, so with this. And with this few lines of code, what you have is essentially an ETL pipeline where you're reading from Kafka and writing out to Parquet, and you're essentially your raw, unstructured uh, binary data encoding JSON is now available in a structured Parquet format uh, within seconds. And of course, you would have some of the st uh, standard problems that Michael was talking about in the keynote, the small data, uh, small files, et cetera. But that's where Databricks Delta comes in, because if you write it to Databricks Delta, you can solve all those problems. But even with Databricks Delta, with Parquet, you get the, 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 the benefit of the structured data being available within seconds. And we can do this really fast. For example, you should take a look at our blog post where we did a benchmark with other streaming systems where we showed that we could do 3x faster than any other uh, system, which translates to that you need 3x lower number of machines, 3x cheaper for you to run your ETL pipeline. Anyways, this was a very brief introduction. Now let me start into the meat of the conversation, uh, meat of this uh, talk, where I'm going to talk about stateful stream processing. Um, so let's start from the very basic on what is stateful stream processing. But to understand that, let's first understand what is stateless. So imagine this ET, previous ETL pipeline, where you are taking every record, parsing it out, writing out to a table. You are essentially doing something purely stateless because you are each record needs to be uh, you're processing each record individually without combining information across any other record. So you don't need to remember any side information uh, to process the records. In contrast, in state full stream processing, let's say you are counting the number of records that you have parsed or maybe additionally filtered. 
then you're essentially combining information across multiple records. And to do, to do this, you need to essentially maintain an, some information on the side. For example, in this case, the running count. That is essentially the state. And, and, and some of the major challenges of doing stateful stream processing is that how do you make sure that this state, that this information you're keeping on the side um, is fault tolerant? And how do you figure out that how do you, re when you're restarting, if, if there's a failure, you're restarting your query, how do you figure, uh, how do you load the exact same version of the state where it failed and things like that? So, th so this is some of the essential challenges of building a distributed stream processing platform. In structured streaming with our macro batch processing, the way it works at a high level is that as you're creating this series of incremental execution plans, each execution plan essentially knows what version of the state it needs to read from. So as uh, each micro batch reads the previous version of the state data, the previous running count, updates it and creates a new version, and each of these different versions essentially gets checkpointed out into the same checkpoint location that you have provided, where the, offs the Kafka offsets are written out. Now, uh, and so, and, and, and with this, the fault recovery uh, becomes uh, um, absolutely seamless and synchronized with the offset, et cetera. So it, needs, it knows exactly where it can uh, restart from. Now, from the concepts to the actual physical layout, the way this state is stored is actually in, the, uh, uh, in Spark's executor memory. So if you're not familiar with Spark's uh, architecture, there is a driver node, and there are multiple worker nodes, which are more actually correctly called executors. And these, ex these executors are the ones that run the tasks that needs to, uh, that, uh, that processes the data. And the state is stored in the memory of these tasks. And when, as these, ta these tasks are launched for each micro batch, the state is updated, and any changes to the state are versioned and checkpointed into gauge DFS into the whatever checkpoint location you have provided. So overall, it gives the same exactly one's fault tolerance guarantee as stateless computations. Anyways, th this was a very short introduction of how exactly state is, works physically. Now let's talk about how, how you can actually, uh, st what, what is our philosophy of exposing this state to the end users to act in the form of stateful operations. Now, in the, in the, in the data frame API, there are a number of stateful operations, which can be roughly categorized into two categories. There are stateful operations that have automatic state cleanup, and then there are stateful operations where uh, there are user-defined state cleanup. Let me elaborate. So for operations, which are standard SQL operations, uh, the semantics of the operation is absolutely clear. For example, if you're counting, then you know exactly how much, uh, what it means, if you're, um, what it means and when your data and the state data is old enough that you can clean up and stuff. It knows, and it knows, you can reason about all of that and automatically clean up old state. Whereas um, for arbitrary non-SQL-like operations that you may want to do, uh, the state cleanup is not automatic because what we want you to do, is give you is essentially the full power of stateful operations um, so that you can control precisely what to keep, or what to throw out, et cetera. And I'm going to, in this, the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain all of these, so hold tight. So to, to give a very high level overview, the gag regression deduplication joins have automatic state cleanup where you really don't need to worry about state and you can just specify watermarks and it'll, the Spark will handle everything else. And then there's, uh, for arbitrary state for computation, there's map group with state, flat map group with state, uh, where you have full control on doing um, state cleanup yourself. And so the rest of my talk is going to be basically um, explore these built-in stateful operations, how to use watermarks to, uh, to do automatic or uh, custom state cleanup, how to build these arbitrary stateful operations, and finally, and, and probably the most important, how to monitor and debug these stateful operations. So the way I'm going to construct this is that uh, at, at, some, at, at roughly the end of the session, I'm going to stop at some point and then continue from there. So let's see if I, in whatever time is left in this session. Let's see how much we can, uh, of this uh, talk we can cover. So the first step, is, and, and, and the simplest one and the most used one is streaming aggregations. And you already saw the simple count as an example. 
You can also aggregate uh, by, uh, by key. You can aggregate by a window on a timestamp inside the data. So that is essentially uh, you're aggregating by the event time. And you can also aggregate by both uh, some arbitrary key and, and uh, the event time. So, so as you can see, the aggregating by event time is simply just applying a window as, as if it's the window is additionally another key. And you can specify the window length, as in this case 10 minutes, also the window sliding interval that uh, I want to, uh, to aggregate by windows of 10 minutes moving every one minute, things like that. And of course, there are built-in aggregations. There are, uh, you, you can write your own custom arbitrary aggregations, user-defined functions and stuff. Now, with these windowed aggregates, uh, what happens is that the way this is constructed, it, it very naturally and um, takes care of uh, late data because for every aggregate window, it's, it's like a bucket. You're, as soon as you receive data for a particular new uh, time window, let's say for the next hour, you automatically open up that bucket and start counting the number of records falling in that bucket. And now these buckets stay open. So even if a data that comes maybe five hour late that belongs to a bucket five hours old, it will just go ahead and update an, uh, that bucket by incrementing the count of a old bucket. And that's what's happening in this timeline that even if data comes in, Late, it just happens to update an older bucket. But with this, uh, the size of the state will continue to increase indefinitely because you really don't know when a bucket can be closed because, uh, because in practically the query is not going to receive data that is maybe five days old. So and to specify that information to the streaming query, that is where we have watermarking. So watermarking is essentially a moving threshold of how late the data is expected to be when we drop, and, 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 and accordingly the system can drop the old state. So the way it is defined is as follows. So imagine at any point of time in the data you have seen a particular, the event time inside the data, you, uh, you have seen the max event time as let's say 12.30 p.m. right now. Uh, this watermark, which you specify by specifying this trailing gap, say 10 minutes, is essentially a moving threshold behind the max event time. So at this point of time, when the max event time is 12.30, the watermark would be 12.20. And the engine automatically tracks this. And so what happens is that data that is older than this watermark will be automatically dropped. So let's say uh, you, um, your data may be suddenly, some, a very small fraction of the data may be older than 10 minutes, but the data is already too late for you to take any decisions on it, so it will automatically drop that data. And uh, any data that is late, but not later than 10 minutes, would be allowed to aggregate. So buckets of the buckets I was talking about would essentially be kept open for that 10 minute duration. But any data that is older than that will be dropped, and those buckets would be automatically closed and cleaned up because that, the, co the corresponding count is not going, to be, uh, not going to change anymore because any data later than that threshold, we are going to drop it anyways. So that's how in, in, uh, the state cleanup happens automatically in aggregation. That's a good question. Let's talk about it offline. Let's hold all the questions to the end of the second session. Okay, so uh, so to, 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 to do watermarking, all you have to do is just call this thing called with watermark on your data frame, specify what is the event time column, and uh, then specify the watermark delay, and that's it. Now, uh, for streaming queries, which does, which does not have any stateful operation, this essentially is completely ignored. For non-streaming queries at all, for like if you, if you write this data frame operation in a batch query, and apply it on a batch data, then it just is completely ignored as well. So you can always add this, and then your query, when if, if it's running on batch data, it'll work. If it's running on streaming data, where there is actually delays, it'll work as expected as well. And at runtime, when the, the, the engine would automatically scan all the data and figure this out. For example, um, it'll, it'll automatically figure out what is the event, max event time the system has seen, uh, and accordingly calculate the 
the, move, the watermark threshold, which is the red line. And then as new data comes in, it'll keep increasing the event time max. Some data may be late if it's later, if it's earlier than the, if it's newer than the threshold, then it will be considered if it's older than the threshold, it will be dropped. So the, we, there's a blog post that I've written uh, uh, that uh, explain this in as much cleaner detail. So uh, please take a look at it if you want to understand a little bit more. So the, now, now the cool thing is that this watermark is essentially a parameter that you can tweak to trade off between how much late data to consider and how much state to keep. So if you want your application to handle a larger amount of delays, like it's 10 minutes is not enough, I have to consider data that was up to a day late, then you have to incur the cost of uh, keeping larger amount of state because you're keeping more buckets open essentially. And uh, so, and, and vice versa, that if you cannot afford to keep that much state in memory because of price concerns, then you have to do that trade-off of not keeping that much late data, not, 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 not consuming late data. So th this is a knob you can tweak for that trade-off. The next one is streaming deduplication. And this is actually exactly what it sounds like. You have a stream of data coming in. The events in that data has a unique identifier, and you want to essentially deduplicate based on the de that identifier, the, in this case, the unique record ID. And so all you need to do is say drop duplicate, specify that unique column the ID, and what internally Spark will automatically do is keep all the past unique identifiers that uh, has been seen in the stream, and if any record matches with the past uh, identified, it will drop that because that record has already been seen. So that's drop duplicate. But again, you don't really, uh, uh, you don't, uh, the, the system doesn't know when uh, you, it is safe to drop old state data. So what you can do is essentially specify the watermark on the timestamp column and also specify timestamp as another unique column. Now, this works only when you know that, uh, that the duplicate record is going to have the same exact record identifier as well as the same record timestamp unit. So this is typically the timestamp that is generated at the source that is creating the record. And maybe the duplication is happening in somewhere while writing to, let's say, Kafka and stuff. So uh, for typically, uh, using the Kafka arrival timestamp may not be the best idea because that is not what is creating duplicates uh, or, or the duplicates are not being created between Kafka and Spark streaming, but duplicates are probably being created somewhere, uh, down, somewhere upstream of Kafka. So you have to give, uh, use the timestamp that is present uh, in the data when the data is being generated uniquely. Same place where the unique record identifier is being generated. So some little details to keep in mind when using watermarks with streaming deduplication. Anyways, so let's start where we left off. We did, stream, we did streaming aggregations, we did streaming deduplications. Now comes the more fun ones, uh, like streaming joins. So Spark has supported uh, stream batch joins, basically joins between a streaming data set and a batch data set since the beginning of structured streaming, so like Spark 2.0. But in 2.3, which was the previous release a couple of months ago, we, uh, we started supporting stream stream joins. And to understand what stream stream joins is and how it works, uh, let's start with a very canonical example of ad monetization. Basically, you have a stream of ad impressions of when the ad was showed, and you have another stream of ad clicks on who clicked on which ad. And essentially, you want to join them by a common ad identifier so that you know that which impression of the ad led to a click, therefore needs to, someone needs to pay someone else. So now this is this conceptually, while it's a simple idea, the real complexity comes because of delays in when the impression arrives and when the click arrives. So most of the time, the click is likely to arrive at your data center or your application after the impression, after the ad was shown, because it was generated after the ad was shown. But sometimes due to delays, what happens is that the, the click, the impression uh, may arrive much later after the click. Random things happen. Now, to deal with these random delays, the 
the streaming app needs to essentially buffer the clicks and the impressions for a sufficient duration so that it can be sure that it sees when there actually is a, a successful join. That is, when there is actually a click and a, and a corresponding impression. So to do this sort of uh, buffering, then it is naturally a stateful operation, where the, the state is essentially the buffer of add you know, impressions and clicks. And so let's see how to actually express this using data frame joins. So let's start with a simple inner join. So you have impressions, which is a streaming data, same, uh, streaming data set or data frame, and uh, join with clicks, which is another streaming data frame data set. And you're saying that you, the click add ID should be equal to the impression add ID. That's it. What the system will automatically do is it will buffer all the past clicks and all the past uh, impressions such that uh, it can match. But again, similar to streaming aggregation, if it has no idea when data is actually old and can be thrown out, the state is going to continue growing indefinitely. So to allow some of the buffered data to be actually dropped, you need to provide in this query additional time constraints, just like watermarks, but this requires some additional stuff, and that's what, I'm, that, and, and, and that what makes this very interesting. So these additional time constraints can be like this. So let's assume that your impressions can be at most two hours late because of delays in the network and stuff like that. Now you can express that as impressions with watermark two hours. Similarly, clicks, let's say, can be three hours late because of, again, same network delays, uh, et cetera. And express in the same way, clicks with watermark three hours. Now, this is the in most interesting part. Let's say that a click can occur only within one hour after the impression. That puts a very hard constraint on when a click can match with an impression. And, and this is important because this is what allows us to actually define when a click, a buffered click is not going to match with an impression anymore and vice versa. So this essentially is uh, a, like a rain join, and uh, and 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 this uh, it, it, what what Spark will do is it will parse these equations that uh, click time is more than impression time and and or, or or to put it simply, click time is between impression time and impression time plus one hour, and what it will do is it will automatically figure out that uh, that uh, essentially impressions need to be buffered for at most four hours. Because if you do the math, uh, you can figure out that three hour late click may match with impressions received four hours ago. I mean, you have to do this math to figure out which Spark automatically does it for you. And just and figure it out that impressions need to be buffered only for four hours, and clicks need to be buffered only for two hours for, it, for, for uh, executing the join correctly. And any event that is older than that particular threshold will be automatically dropped by Spark, and any buffered event will automatically be cleaned up. And, and this is the magic that happens automatically. All you need to provide is this additional constraint of a couple of watermark delays and the time uh, constraint between the left time and the right time bounded in both directions. That left time should be between uh, certain right time and certain right time plus something. Something, something in that equation form. So, and we also support outer joins with uh, time constraints, but the difference with the inner join is that in inner join, specifying those watermark and time constraints is optional. Uh, if you don't specify it, that's fine. It's just your state will keep growing indefinitely. For some use cases, that is fine uh, because state is small, uh, et cetera, but it is optional. But in outer join, it is not optional. You have to specify the time constraint and the watermark constraint for this. And this is because in outer join, if you remember what outer join is, you, if a row does not match, let's say it's a left outer join. So if, if the left side input record does not match with any out, uh, right, right side record, it needs to be output as left join, uh, sorry, left side and null. So to generate these null inputs, there has to be, the, the, the system has to figure out when it can say that a record is never going to match, so it, I'm going to output it, output it as null, which means that you need to specify these uh, time constraints. Uh, 
what the side effect of that is also is that those null outputs come uh, gets produced at a delay because the system needs to actually wait for a, a the certain period of time let's say around the watermark delay the two hours and three hours that you specified uh, to be sure that there is not going to be any further matches for that record so this is what the, uh, the difference between outer join and inner joins are. Anyways, both of these are available in Spark right now. It is, you can just use it. All the state management is magical. Automatic state cleanup and dropping of late data. Now, the, fin the, the final operation that is going to talk about is the arbitrary stateful operation. So if you cannot express your computation in the form of a SQL operation like join, aggregation, uh, deduplication, etc., then this is your final result. And this is essentially like uh, jumping down to native code after you have used Python, Scala or Python. You have to do your own memory management, essentially, but not that low. Um, so <clears throat> so uh, typical uses are uh, like user tracking, sessionization, where you want to basically track, let's say, a user is, uh, has come to your website and is clicking on stuff, and you want to track the user's movement to understand what uh, products the user may be interested in. So you, uh, to kind of simplify the problem, let's say you want to uh, track user actions, logins, clicks, and stuff, and you want to essentially maintain uh, the, the current user status on what the user is currently actively doing. Is it online? Is it active? Is it inactive, but online, et cetera? So let's use this example application and understand how we can solve this. And, and, and the solution to all this is these two operations that we provide on data frames called map group with state and the more general version of flat map group with state. So I'm going to start with the map group with state and, uh, and kind of generalize it further. Uh, so it's, uh, it is, it's been available since Spark 2.2, but currently it is in Scala and Java only. And which, um, because for writing this complex code, you need the type safety, and so and that we can provide uh, in Scala and Java only uh, right now, uh, because of obvious reasons. So it is currently available in Scala and Java only. So again, reminder that this is the essentially the second type of stateful operation where you have no automatic state cleanup or dropping of old data. You are in full control of uh, all of this, and therefore you need to do all of this explicitly. And so you can add watermark to understand what is the progress of event time in the query, but no late data will be dropped based on that watermark. So you have to figure that out yourself. You have to drop it explicitly. And for those people who have used DStreams, uh, map with state, and update state by key, this is a far more powerful version of that and a far more efficient version. So let's start. How do you use map group with state? So I'm going to break it down into a few steps. And, then, and this is how you should think about your problem. So step one, define your data structures. So what is the input event? Is it a bunch, it's a bunch of user actions. Let's figure out what the data structure looks like. It has a user ID, it has some action. Um, then what is the state you want to keep for every user, which is essentially the user status. And uh, again, user ID, let's say you just want to track whether it's, he's active or not. And what do you want to output? Now, this can be different from the user status, but let's keep it simple. Let's say every time I update the user status because there is some new event for that user, I'm going to output the latest user status for writing it some other place. OK. Step two is define your state updating function. Now, this function essentially needs three inputs. One is the grouping key, which is the user ID, because that's what you're grouping the whole thing by. Uh, it, it is a generator of new data, new user actions, and what was the previous state, which is, in this case, the previous user status. And using these three inputs, you can uh, compute what the next status is going to be based on the new actions that you, that you have received. And it's Spark's job to actually call this function over and over again for every group as new data comes in. So. Define, so it gives it the function, you define what to do when there are new actions for a particular group. So you get the previous user status, update the status with the new actions, explicitly say that this is my updated state, and then in this case, return the status, the, the, the updated status or previous status, whatever you want. So, and then the final step is obviously take this function and stick it inside the data frame operation 
map group with state. So you're grouping by the user ID and then saying map, map the group with state using this function. So now again, as with all other data frame operations, it works with both batch and streaming data. In batch query, it essentially has no prior state uh, and will not going to use any uh, updated state ever because everything is called on the function with all the data for the, each group. So it's essentially boils down to something like data frames uh, map groups. That's it. But it completely works. So you can use static data to test your map grouping function as well as um, run it on streaming as well. So now, what happens if, since you don't have any state cleanup or anything, uh, you have no idea when to actually clean up the state. Let's say, for example, the user was inactive for a long period of time. Practically, he has essentially uh, been signed out. So there was no event from the user because he did not click sign out. So what happened, how to deal with that? And that's why we support timeouts. And there, uh, when a group essentially does not get any, any data for a, a substantial period of time, then the function that you've provided will be called again. That is, when you're hitting the timeout, the function will be called again, except the, the new actions, the second parameter of the, act, the, the iterator of user actions will be an empty iterator. And so using, but that in that, when that function is called with an empty iterator, essentially you can do whatever action is needed to essentially sign off that person and, and say, I'm and clear of the state because you don't want to track that user anymore because he's not active anymore. So uh, now there are three types of timeout supported. Well, there's only two types, but you, you can choose not to have any timeout or event time timeout or processing time timeout. So the event time timeout essentially uses the event time in the data and processing time timeout uses the wall clock time of your cluster, essentially. Now again, timeouts completely ignored if you run the map group with state as a batch query. How to use event time timeout is basically you just specify the event time timeout as the type of timeout for the entire query and you have to enable watermarking because that's what is going to track the event time and use that. And and then inside the mapping function, you need to actually, for every group, specify uh, the timeout duration. So the event time timeout as a type is for the entire query, like all, for all the, across all the groups, whereas the, the timeout duration can be specified to be on a per group level. So depending on maybe the type of user, you could have a one hour timeout or a 10 hour timeout. So, premium user versus freemium user. You can think of use cases more than me. Um, so, uh, so, so you need to specify that. And, and then um, when timeout actually happens, you can detect that by this uh, handy uh, methods called has timeout and stuff. And when it has actually hit the timeout, then um, you can just clean up the state and by saying state.remove. But if you haven't hit the timeout, then every time the function is called, you need to specify the timeout. You need to re kind of reset the timeout because the timeout is kind of cleared every time new data is received. So that's something you need to keep in mind when you're using timeouts. And the way the event time timeout works is that the watermark is calculated based on the max event time, et cetera, across all the groups. When one particular group does not receive data, but the watermark has moved for the timeout duration for that group, then the function will be called on that group with has timeout set to true and an empty iterator and stuff. Otherwise, the function will keep getting called with whatever new data, and every time the function is called, the timeout that you set previously is, is reset, and you need to set it once again. So that, and this is designed such that you have full control every time to update the timeout based on what your current state is or user status is and stuff. The processing time timeout is actually far simpler, uh, where you just wait for the wall clock time if the, a particular group has not received any data for that time period in the wall clock time, in real world time, um, then do whatever is needed. Same, the function will get called with empty iterator and has time dot set to true. Uh, but it's, it's important to remember that this is strictly dependent on the wall clock time. Uh, so if it so happens that your query failed or you stopped the query and, and uh, restarted it one hour later, 
then you will see a whole flurry of processing time timeouts because it was down for one hour. So things must have timed out. And that's the semantics. So you have to pick and choose what you want in what type of timeout you want. So this was map group with state. The flat map group with state is essentially a generalization of that, where in map group with state, you basically have to uh, return one object. In flat map group with state, you can return multiple objects in the form of an iterator, which can also be empty. That is, you, you, want to, you, you may want to update the state and there is nothing worthwhile returning, so you may choose not to return anything in that particular function call. So that's essentially the generalization and stuff. There are, there, there are other uh, more detailed things that, um, uh, that are present, like things like output mode, where it gives actually a little bit more information about what your function uh, is doing, I, is your function, the, the, the items that the, your function is generating, are they like new rows being appended, which is essentially the append mode, or are they like each item inside the, what is returning is essentially like updating the previous value. And based on that, you can essentially, uh, um, the, the, the engine can figure out how to optimize the query and how to write it out to external system, should, I, should, we, should it continue to append? all the rows, or should it update out into an external storage system and stuff like that? So these are, again, super advanced stuff, and uh, please look at my blog post for really understanding these and stuff. So anyways, these are all the stateful operations. Hopefully you understood it. Please play around with it to, for better understanding. There's obviously the, the programming guide and their blog posts to actually uh, uh, explain some of these in more detail. So the next step and is, is how to manage these streaming queries. And, and, and the question that I often get is that, how do I figure out what is the right cluster size, what is the number of shuffle partitions? So, uh, so all of these are essentially partitioned by key. So the number of shuffle partitions matters. And, um, and, 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 and the setting the number of shuffle partitions in this sort of streaming query has a slightly different optimization function than sh setting the shuffle partitions for a batch query. And this is because of the stateful operation that uh, needs to be done. It needs to write, out, write it out to, uh, to HDFS, et cetera, which has additional per task overheads, uh, which doesn't exist in a batch query. So the, the recommended idea is that set the number of shuffle partitions to one to three times the number of cores that give you in your cluster. If you set it too low, then you're not using the cluster enough. If you're setting it too high, like 10 times the number of cores, then uh, what may happen is that the per task overhead start building up and your latency will increase. Uh, but again, there is a, all of these are knobs that are flexible, then you have to tweak it. Let's say you want to do auto scaling, in which case uh, you have to set the, shuff the shuffle partitions in terms of the maximum number of cores your auto scaling cluster will, is, is expected to have. And if, it, if, it, if the load is low and it scales down, then uh, maybe sli slightly higher latency because there are more tasks per core, et cetera. Those are some, those are some of the things you need to tweak when you actually uh, have developed your application and you want to essentially uh, optimize it for production use. The other thing you need to worry about is the total size of state per worker. And so the, uh, the, the, the larger state needs to, leads to essentially higher overloads uh, higher overheads for snapshotting, JVM, GC issues and stuff. Now to understand what is the total size of state, you can, you can monitor the state of the query state. So there are a couple of ways. One, you can, you can actually get the current state of the state, like how many state keys, what is the memory used, et cetera, just by uh, using the query handle and saying query.lastprogress or query.recentprogress, which gives you a, a JSON or uh, got a struct of a lot of metrics, including rates and stuff, including the current state of state operators, how many rows in the state. Or you can do it completely asynchronously using by uh, uh, writing your custom streaming query listener, which is an interface by which you can, um, for which you can write a custom implementation and register it and the engine will automatically call your implementation with the latest progress information, or uh, asynchronous as the query is running and making progress by running microbatches. In Databricks, though, a little bit of a plug for Databricks here. 
uh, this is automatically inside the Databricks notebook. As soon as you start a query inside the Databricks notebook, you automatically see those streaming metrics right inside the cell that you have started. So this we have made it much easier for you to monitor your streaming queries. Now, if you want to dig a little in more detail than uh, how many um, how many total state keys and stuff, let's say you want to find out uh, is your state skewed in any way, which is causing problems, is um, is writing the state out to an external storage like HDFS or S3 extremely slow? Is that what sort of those lower level details? And you need to resort to the Spark UI in the, in the SQL tab, which shows the full details of all the metrics of the SQL plan that is running. Uh, and that has all lower level details. Now, actually, a bunch of you already asked um, how to deal with very large state, like hundreds of millions of rows. So the uh, in the default implementation inside Apache Spark, the state data is essentially kept in the JVM heap, which translates that to the fact that when you have millions of keys per executor, you can have GC issues uh, like arbitrary GC pauses and uh, in the worst case, ooms and stuff. So you have to basically configure your uh, Spark cluster in the, st in the right way, either partition and distribute it further in a larger cluster, et cetera, so that the expected size of the state per executor is within the limits of what the executor can handle. And what may happen is that you will see these very large spikes because of GC issues and stuff. Or the solution that we have inside Databricks Runtime is we can manage state with RocksDB, where basically instead of keeping the state inside uh, the JVM heap, it is kept on RocksDB running inside the executors, uh, uh, which essentially instead of using just memory, it uses memory and local SSD efficiently. But you also, but it also in our RocksDB based state management solution, it writes it out to uh, HDFS in the same way, giving full fault tolerance guarantees uh, as the default implementation. And so please look at the Databricks docs for more details on how to use RocksDB. Anyways, I'm, I'm coming very close to the end of my talk. So a little bit about what the future looks for us. So a major initiative right now that is happening in, in structure streaming is continuous processing, which, which we announced in, in, in Spark 2.3 as an experimental release. And it actually can give millisecond level latencies by running it not in micro batches, but in actual true streaming fashion. Uh, so this is the, like, the next big one of the next big thing that is happening in structured streaming, and we're going to push towards this, and we can, and uh, and my colleague Jose is going to talk more about it in today at uh, 2 p.m. Please go and learn about continuous processing with the talk, and we've also blogged about it. So, and this affects all these stateful operators as well because we want all of these shuffle and stateful operators to work uh, with continuous processing mode, which in Spark 2.3 it doesn't. So we we are working towards supporting all of them. So that is something is what is exciting us right now and that, we, that, that is keeping us really motivated and passionate about uh, providing millisecond level latencies for even for stateful operations. More information is on uh, the programming guide, Apache programming guide, Databricks docs. Please look at our blog post for more detailed deep dives into each of these items. Um, and, and if you want to learn more about just the basics, like more about what sources are supported, what things are supported, how to use those, please take a look at my previous talk on the basics of structured streaming, where I talk in about Kafka, Kinesis, et cetera.